I'd like to call to order the instructional subcommittee meeting of Monday, May 20th at Morton Middle School. Uh, we're going to start off with roll call. Mr. Agia? Here. Mr. Coogan? Here. Mr. Corey? Here. Right, let's do a salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Brief announcement I have to read. Pursuant to the open meeting law, any person may make an audio or video recording of this public meeting or may transmit this meeting through any medium. Attendees are therefore advised that such recording or, or transmissions are being made whether perceived or unperceived by those present and are deemed to be acknowledged and permissible. The first item for discussion tonight is to review the turnaround schools, and I'm going to turn it over to our uh, assistant superintendent, Julie Carlson. So um, what I did is I just, I, I'm a big fan of visuals, so I gave you a little bit of a visual. Um, around December, we wrote for something called the Turnaround Assistance Grant. Um, we really wanted to have additional funds in order to support our six turnaround schools for writing not only their turnaround plans, but in tablet situation, they're writing for the SRG grant. Um, what I did is I just kind of broke it down. Um, anything that has a code of 325 are funds that we can utilize all the way through August. And anything with a code of 222 are funds that we can utilize up until June 30th. Um, on the next page, what I did is I broke down where we are and how we've been utilizing those funds. And we've been really specific. We have hosted across our six schools uh, four very large meetings with our partners, Teachers 21. And it was, the idea was to support our principals in the, turn, the key turnaround strategies of visioning and missioning, assets and challenges, um, looking at how to write benchmarks, and then working with the teams in order to uh, better uh, write their turnaround plans. We had a lot of success at Morton, as well as Henry Lord Community School with Teachers 21, but we need a little additional support at Durfee um, because of the large capacity and the work that they need to do. So we also employed an organization called Instill. They are a consultant organization that's contracted by Massachusetts um, to do our um, MSVs or our monitoring site visits with SchoolWorks. And so they have just recently um, gone through two um, sessions and will continue with one large session and then to help Derby finalize their plans. All of our schools, um, Fonska has already had their SRG renewed. Watson um, had their updated benchmarks approved and Talbot has just recently submitted their school resource grant um, application and we go on Wednesday for our final interview with the state. Um, and then our three schools that are within the lowest 10% uh, will be submitting their plans um, for review and hopefully submission um, by June. And I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Principal Raposo who's gonna talk a little bit more specifically about Talbot. Okay, thank you. Um, so. At Talbot Middle School, as Dr. Carlson stated, we submitted a school redesign grant. Um, that grant amount is uh, $937,000 over the course of three years. Uh, so as part of that, we um, went through a uh, very lengthy, thorough process with a, with a large team from Talbot and ILT um, to basically engage in like root cause analysis, uh, what has not worked at Talbot in the past, right? So it's a school that has attempted some redesign efforts that haven't necessarily taken a hold in the past. And so we did um, quite a bit of data analysis. We landed on um, some initiatives that are outlined in our grant. Um, over the course of three years, it's roughly $300,000 a year. We front loaded a little bit of the funding in year one. Um, some of the biggest uh, sort of uh, initiatives are um, around uh, implementing uh, teacher leaders. So adding some teacher leaders over at Talbot. So one of the things we wanna really try to do is uh, build opportunities for shared leadership so that um, the redesign work is sustainable over time and it doesn't live with just an admin team or a specific person. So we want to engage teachers in that process. Um, we're also adding, uh, proposing to add 30 minutes to the school day, um, which will enable us to have, carve out a 45 minute intervention block uh, for students. 
at this time, Tablet does not have uh, any sort of RTI or MTS system for kids at all. Um, uh, we're also going to be focusing on implementing um, culture responsive teaching strategies and uh, school-wide uh, curriculum for, for SEL, um, utilizing like trauma-sensitive practices with kids. Um, and then the last piece is we have to really leverage. So Talbot does have a 21st century after-school program. What we found was that we really weren't um, maximizing its potential. So we had a program, but we weren't using it as strategically as possible. So looking at that existing program, being more strategic with it, um, and that, that's after school and in the summer, and then bringing in a mentoring program as well for Talbot. So to target some of our, um, not just high-risk kids, but um, really focus on building relationships with, you know, we're gonna probably target a subgroup of about 50 students at Talbot um, around a, a, an intensive mentoring program. So this is some of the, um, overall some of the big issues. The district supported us with, we've had an ESL Academy this year. We graduated five teachers. Um, I think their last class was actually this past weekend. So that can lead to dual licensure. So they're ready to take the ESL test. So I'll have five folks that are certified in the content area that'll also be dual certified in ESL. I'm gonna continue that next year. Um, and then we've also advocated during the budget process for a couple of additional positions specific for ESL and special education to support our, our subgroups. And the program um, that we're also adding on, which is the Mentoring as Coaches for Change, which I know that some of you are familiar uh, because we have it over at Henry Ward this year for the first year, and it's been hugely successful, so we're really excited yep. about that. Uh, any questions, guys? Yeah, I just have a question. Mr. Uh, Corey. I was very impressed when I went to your school uh, on Friday uh, for Generation uh, for Civics Day, Generation Citizen, and um, I already I could already tell that there was a breath of fresh air in the environment of your school. I felt felt a wave of enthusiasm as I was there that I, I didn't see previous um, last year, the year before, um, and so um, I think there's a big turnaround going on at Talbot. And uh, we should absolutely uh, support you in that endeavor. And that's what I fully intend to do. Thank you, with that I yield. Okay. So, when I looked at the agenda and I saw this item, to be quite honest, I thought we were gonna get more information. I think it's very limited in what, what we have. I mean, this is what it is. So you mentioned this analysis has been done by all of the schools and all. I'm just wondering why we don't get that as school committee members to know what the, I think you mentioned assets and challenges. They do a lot of work. They have teams getting paid. They have consultants getting paid to come up with data and information on why you're going to do X, Y, or Z. Mm -hmm. Quite honestly, we have none of that. So I'm taking his word for it, which I get, and I know that you have it. I'm just but maybe we can, it. Yeah. So We can share the plan. That could be sent to you in five seconds. But I think that that's just, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be difficult here, it's just a review of the turnaround schools. If you ask me to look at the information that's been presented to me to re comment on the review, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. And I'm a person that reads the information that wants to get into the nitty gritty. Why do they want certain things in the budget? Why, do, why things might change? Do we need to give them more resources? We see it sit at meetings and we hear, oh, we got everything we need in the budget. And then I just hear Mr. Raposo say, we're applying for a grant for $900,000 over three years based on the needs that they have after we looked at it. Now, as one member, I got a problem with that. Not that we need the 900,000, but we can't in one breath say in a meeting like this, we want to apply to the state to give us $300,000 a year to help with the needs that we have after all kinds of research. And less than two months ago say, well in the budget, we get everything we need. Because if that second statement was accurate, this gentleman wouldn't be here saying we're calling for a grant for nine hundred thousand dollars. So I, I just don't. I'm not feeling the get everybody on the same page. Um, the budget stuff. Maybe there's some things in the budget that need to change. Maybe there's more money coming down that we have to. If we got more information, we might say, you know what, these turnaround schools. Why wait for the state to come in? Let's say that nine hundred thousand goes south, and they say no, we're not going to fund it. Why can't we find some of it? Right now, the school committee doesn't even know what it's in. <clears throat> and it's not only your school, I think there's other schools. When I look at the grant, um, 
the old document you gave about grant funds that were paid for the, all of the schools, turn around schools, something that looks like this. Yeah, Track and sheet, one you know, is yeah. up here. Quite frankly, this is not enough money to do the work that we need to do, in my opinion. When I look at that, I look at it and say, um, everybody gets paid to do extra. Everybody, except for the principals. Principals are the ones that just say, okay, I'm on salary, so I have a school that needs all this extra work. I don't get anything. But everybody that's working with you on the team gets it. I have a problem with that. I think that we should share the resources more. And if we have to take a bold step and say the principals are getting paid a lot of money, but they also need to be fairly compensated for the work they do, we need to step up and say that too. And that's not an easy vote. But I'm ready to take it today because, quite frankly, he's done more work on his plan just by without even seeing it, just like the other turnaround people, but everybody else can get paid. And that's I think that's an issue that this committee's got to deal with. So I don't I really can look into what, um, why. My understanding is that because of the principals um, are not able to receive stipend pay, which is what this um, state grant that we applied for and were awarded. So Mr. Damaris is in the same boat, um, as well as Dr. Bronhart, Ms. Carvalho, and Ms. Lisi are not able to, and Ms. Patterson are not able to receive stipends um, because the work is done within technically their contracted um, workday. So we can't pay teachers. I'm not sure where you're getting that from that it can't. So maybe yeah. you could find so, it and so, send it to us. Sure, I, 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 can, I can definitely look into that. Um, I can tell you though that the principals have brought this to the superintendent's attention um, and who has offered, um, I'm trying to think of the term, um, not to to have um, what's the term? Comp time. What now? Comp, comp time. time. Yes, thank you. Which none of those principles that are dedicated are going to take. Yeah. So you might as well not even offer it. Just in my, I'm not being wise. I'm just I, pointing I, out the facts. Well, like we're getting pretty far off the track here for the instructional subcommittee. Well, that's more. I don't think so. I well, that's more time and money. I think we're straight on the turnaround schools, and I'm specifically addressing the issues of the turnaround schools that are in here. And I can tell you all the reports um, and all the uh, school improvement plans, once they have been accepted, we share them each year. So last year we uh, shared all the school improvement plans with the school committee and we'll do the same thing. Um, none of them have been accepted yet, um, Talbot as well. So we are not to that point yet, um, but we can definitely note that you would like to have maybe access on an ongoing basis and I can check in on that. Yeah, I mean, I would specifically ask for the ask for some challenges for every turnaround school. Yeah, I, I like. Um, I, I don't have a problem with the extra information. Uh, my position was we should have asked for it last week when we got these things. Said, hey, wait, what else is coming with it? I don't have a problem. Kevin's probably right on the lack of information, but we had these things for like four or five days. I would have called Deb and said, hey, listen, I got a couple of questions. Um, ship the stuff to me. That would have been fine. So we can get it anytime yeah, we ask. I mean, for it. That can be your position. My yeah. position is that when we get a, a budget, when we get an agenda item, we should just get all the information. Uh, ahead of time. Well, some so of this stuff can go forever, Kev. I do think that um, we, d we have to take a look a little deeper, and if we don't get the grants, we need to make some decisions on the, what funding's coming we have available to help these people before it gets to the point of being too far gone, and then we, we're struggling to figure it out. So I'm all in favor of giving these general schools more resources and access to change budget items if they need to, which I believe they have. The budget's already been in. Let's say now with some different stuff, I think they should be able to use those documents to say, I'd rather have X than Y or whatever, and I'll be in support of that with that item. Tom? Yeah, so Brian, I wanted to come back to you. I was, uh, <clears throat> so four teachers bought into uh, the ESL thing. Five this year, yep. Yeah, five. Yep. So that's going to be five additional, you know, resources that you're in your building mm -hmm. that are going to handle that population that in that demographic. Right. Are they enthusiastic about it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the the goal is to, that was our first pilot, so the goal is to continue that this year um, and add some more folks to that program. So I think they're excited about it. I think teachers want to do well, right? They want to do what's best by their kids. And so in as I've met with teachers about that, specifically the ESL Academy, um, they wish that they had known it before, right? Because they've had students all year that are English learners but at least now they know. So they keep saying, hey, next year's gonna be even better, right? They can hit the ground running. And yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. yeah so, so like I said, there's, there seems to be a breath of fresh air 
surrounding that building. So you look at your building right now, it was clearly a program in need of improvement. And so there's a turnaround going around. So um, are, are you happy with the resources allocated so far? Or are, are there areas of need that you might single out? So that's a good question. I think, you know, to your point as well, um, part of the reason we had to apply for this grant is because we fall in that first to third percentile. So this is specific to those schools. What's important is part of the grant process actually has to answer that question. If for some reason you're not awarded these funds, you know, what's next? So what are you gonna do? So we had to think about, you know, maybe there's a chance we have to come back to the table with the district and say, hey, I might need a little bit more resource here. I think right now, it's a matter of looking at what we do have and using it in the most strategic way possible. Um, I advocated for some additional positions. The superintendent supported me. Um, I advocated to have the ESL Academy next year and the superintendent supported me. So I think anything that I've asked for as an identified need, you know, um, I've been supported in. One important point is, who knows, I may come back to the table next year and say, you know what, we tried this or we're realizing we need this other resource, so maybe I need to convert something or ask for something different. So obviously that, you know, there's always a possibility. Um, but I think right now we have a pretty good plan in terms of, you know, what, how we can improve things at Talbot with a little bit more resources. One big piece of this plan is, is you know, the ELT, right? So adding, right. adding 30 extra minutes, that's a huge win um, in being able to have, you know, an intervention block carved into the day. So, um, you know, that, that, that's not an easy ask, um, but the staff are on board and, and, and willing to do that. Yeah, I mean, your school currently gets out of what, 212 or something? 210, like? yeah, we're the shortest middle school day. Yeah, yeah. Out of all three. So you're going to add a half hour to half that hour. day? Yep. Yeah, that's going to that's gonna, uh, yeah. hopefully reap some huge benefits there. Yep. It, uh, Brian, is that going to be an additional period or time on every period, or how are you going to add the time? Yeah, that's a good question. So we're going to re, um, we looked at the schedule and uh, we basically are going to carve out. We had had a really extended morning time, about a half hour. Um, to be perfectly honest, I mean that's the longest homeroom I think any you know out of, out of any middle school we have. So we're going to shorten that by 15. We're going to then start the day right after homeroom after 15 minutes. Kids are going to go into advisory on Monday, and then Tuesday through Friday will be an intervention block for 45 minutes. The rest of the day will continue with one hour blocks. So all the core subjects will still get an hour, but every single day we'll have that 45 minute. We chose to put it right in the morning. We just feel like kids are pretty focused, kind of right at, you know, beginning of the day, 15 minute homeroom, and then plug them right into their, their intervention. Is the homeroom teacher gonna teach the intervention block too? Uh, kids will be, um, it'll be based on data, so based on their needs. So we're gonna use, when MCAS data is released, we'll use that for the first cycle, gotcha. and then we're still, we're an ANET school. Um, so after we take our first ANET, we can regroup kids. So I'm, I'm weak in math, I'm going with the math. Right, teacher. right, that's the goal. And then some kids who, want acceleration, they may not land in the ELA or math intervention, they might be doing science, you know, some sort of acceleration thing or a social studies, you know, whatever it might be. My second question is, your 21st century grant stuff is after school. Exactly. And you said you're gonna change the way that's being utilized. Yeah, I think we're just gonna, you know, we have a well-attended program, so the kids wanna come. Right. Um, I think we can be even more strategic about the kids we're recruiting and what we're doing with them. So we actually had asked this year, we had, Department of Ed came down, um, did a visit to the program. They made some really good suggestions because there was, I think we can be more strategic. For instance, there's a tutoring component. It wasn't too strategic. Some kids maybe didn't even have work, you know, that sort of thing. So we're trying to say, how do we maximize that? We get that grant anyway. We're keeping kids till 4.30 in the afternoon, four days a week or four o'clock in the afternoon right now. Next year it'll be 4.30. So that's a lot of time, right? And there's a huge enrichment component, but there's also supposed to be some sort of an academic component. So we just want to make that, we want to refine it even more for next year. And same thing in the summer. We, the 21st century funds are for after school as well as our summer program. Okay. I, I, I got one question from Matt too. That instill program, what is that? That's a, that's a consultancy that- They helping you write the plan? You're right. Helping us, they're guiding us through the thinking and, and making sure we're on the right track. We are doing the writing. You're doing the writing, they're doing the reviewing and review, critique. make and, suggestions, yeah. okay. look at that. You know, Exclusively that. for your plan? Yes. And still, okay. Any other questions, guys? No. Okay. Uh, 
guess Julie's going to continue right on with the district turnaround plan. So along the same vein, um, in having six schools that are in turnaround right now, the district decided to revamp how we are writing school improvement plans. And I just gave you a short snippet because this is in the process right now. Um, we have had a full principals meeting where we identified in each of the four turnaround practices what we felt um, was our biggest area of need. And we are going to have a full pullout day for the Office of Instruction where all of the different leads by departments, um, ELA, math, ELL, uh, we have two principals, an elementary and a secondary principal on that team. And we're going to be spending a whole day revising and editing and developing a district turnaround plan. Um, and this plan will be the new format for all the principals um, that we will introduce over the um, Administrative Institute this summer. And then principals with their teams will be developing their school-based goals, um, all with the idea that we will be moving towards student achievement. On the page directly following, I included the four turnaround practices. Many uh, of them are overlapping, and um, I sent with home with you all a copy of what the school improvement plans template looks like so far, um, but that is definitely in the <coughs> process of changing with input from all the different stakeholders within the district. Um, but what we did decide upon was that we want to stay within the four turnaround practices as they're evidence and research based. And we wanted to make sure that our goals um, could align from the district all the way down to the individual students. And so that we all had a plan in place on how we were going to address each of the four core areas of turnaround. And when will the plan be done? So we're hoping before the end of the school year um, so that we, yes, so okay. that we can introduce it at our admin institute I've been directed it needs to be done by the end of the school year. Okay. So it's going to get done. It's just we want to make sure that all the appropriate voices are heard. So like I said, at our principals meeting, we had all but, I think, one principal in attendance. Uh, I'm sorry, two that were in attendance. And that was great because we also had the uh, Office of Instruction at large. Okay. And we were able to break into groups, um, understand each of the turnaround practices, because not everyone is well versed in each of the turnaround practices. Um, but we studied them, um, we looked at what we do very well in areas of need, and then all the principals got to select the one area that we wanted to make a focus on with the understanding that a plan takes more than one year to really implement well. Okay. So you hope to have it in effect next year? Yes. Mr. Corey. So I'm looking at the four core points, and um, I realize the importance of each one of those points the one that I gravitate to naturally uh, as a former educator is school climate and culture. Mm -hmm. And in front of me I have two principals, a middle school and a high school principal who I know for a fact have gone into their schools and created a different culture inside their building that I think just aids the district improvement plan. I really do. And so I mean, not only would I like to compliment both principals for going in and changing the culture, that's a real hard thing to do, to create buy-in on behalf of the faculty and staff, you know, so that everybody contributes collaboratively and then get the students to understand what's going on. And uh, I know that Durfee is a huge building with a couple of thousand students. It's a big, big job, but I know for a fact that there's a healthier attitude inside that building now than there was previously and for that, I, I hope that we continue to focus not only on these, but continue to support our principals, school climate and culture. With that, I yield. Anything, Kev? No. Just the timeline that was in the, uh, for the plan, is that the typical approving of the uh, school improvement plans, or is that backed up a little? Is it? That, that's for the school specific timeline. So it's the timeline we've used since I've been here. Um, so when I started, um, I brought in the school improvement plan, really the format. We did it in different modalities across the, the district, um, but we really wanted to kind of have one format, um, one um, place to submit them. And then I meet with the principals to go over their school improvement plans, to review their goals. I look at their action plans and then we approve them. Um, so yeah, the timeline, it, it looks tight, but the whole point is that it's 
in years two, three, and four, it's really an edit and refinement of your school improvement plan. Um, but what we really wanted to do, because the past ones were an ELA goal, a math goal, um, a science goal, and then attendance, and then at the high school we had a graduation goal. But really what we wanted to do was to switch to look at the four turnaround areas with the understanding that if we focused on the four turnaround, they will all have an impact on student achievement in the ELA math and science. So it's a little bit of a shift. Um, so we're gonna give about, it's about a month and a half where school so teams are gonna I was be- I just saying this thing here, mm -hmm. is the old one? Or no, that's, that has the, the new to date, um, but no, that's, it's the same format, it's just the content is the new right. suggested content. I was content. just looking at the timing in here. It seemed like it was, by the time it gets approved, almost Thanksgiving now. That's you know, about. So it's a quarter of the year done, and it, sometimes it might, like I said, carry for years, but it just struck me. Yeah, it was like, what do you do from September to then? Obviously, mm. you're probably doing the things you should be doing, but <laughs> I would hope, but you know, it. it That's what we like build in time over the summer. So we have a whole day, which is Wednesday of our summer institute for ad administrators, that they actually go off to their schools, and that's what they're working on. And then on our final day, they have like a team approach where they get to review each other's with all district <coughs> leads going around. What we're really trying to set up the Office of Instruction is more of a customer support. Um, having been a principal for years, we really want to ensure that our principals are successful in the building. So instead of just adding things, we're trying to streamline and make things a little bit easier for them, yeah. um, as opposed to just putting more on their plate. Right. No, I, I get it. I get what you're saying. I like that. Just that I'm looking at this. It says the administrators in ILT developed the SIP draft October 20th. Mm -hmm. and where you were saying it's in the summer, to get a day to plan it, to get it. To me, that just seems, uh, the year's already sort of, you've started, and it, is there a way to move it forward, or is this just the way it is? Well, the hard thing is, is in years past, we didn't have MCAS data, MCAS. so we weren't able to have measurable goals without data to support that. Um, so it really depends. We've been told that we're gonna get MCAS data right. back earlier, but we're still not sure. So yes, if we're able to get data back, then we'll, that will speed up the process. Um, but really, it's it's a living document. I've always talked to principals that even if it's approved, doesn't mean we can't change what it looks like. It's really a roadmap to success. So um, <coughs> I, I hear what you're saying, the, the, the whole idea about it being October, but we don't even take our first benchmark assessment until October. And that's when a lot of the data starts to align. So we get to see how kids performed in their previous school year. And then the benchmark assessment really gets to see how they're doing at present to see if there's been any regression. So a lot of that plays into how we're writing the goals and objectives. But yes, if we get data earlier, this is the first year that they said we're just gonna get it this summer, um, then yes, we should be able to and increase. And these the schools, the other, Turnaround schools already have the ANET. So it, we're not going to ask the, uh, the turnaround schools to write in a new format. We're trying to make it so that the, all I schools. I would say that data is available earlier. Yes. Well, Talbot's the only the school that's year, yeah. submitted their plan thus far. Fonska has already been approved and Watson, so those are all um, plans that you're able to see. Talbot's has not been approved yet, which is why we haven't shared it. Uh, I was meaning the uh, ANET, they've been using it at multiple schools. Oh yes, so we have so ANET. that data is obviously yes. used to yes. start the year. And we're taking it now and you get <coughs> results right away. So, so at our last- We'll have a good end of year data. At our last OOI subcommittee meeting, we shared, um, it was a benchmark tracker. So it had like the ANET schools results. It had our test right. whiz results. I don't know if you remember that. It was like a online. Mm -hmm. So we keep that throughout the year, um, and it has all the updated assessments, uh, attendance, suspensions, all different types of data. It's our data dashboard. Tom, Tom. Uh, Dr. Carlson, any interesting learning walks coming up? Um, a lot of them are closing down. Um, we have a very big meeting tomorrow for our middle school ELA teachers. Um, we are planning a full training date um, for all of our middle school teachers and our department heads. Um, but for walks, we have a full walk at Watson that's coming up. Um, we're actually walking with um, a school district out of Connecticut that wants to see um, uh, the Kathy Fosnett um, Context for Learning Instruction. 
going on. So, but not from the Office of Instruction. We don't have any formal okay. walks. We have completed all of those for this cycle, much to the, the uh, thrill <laughs> teachers. <laughs> And not at the high school because they're actually about ready to start um, the science MCAS and they have graduation, so we're trying to not overload everyone at once. Yeah, if there's any, even into the next school year, if you think that uh, we could be invited, then please Absolutely. put the invitation out. Absolutely. So after having participated in the learning walk at, uh, at RPA, I really enjoyed that day. I got to see a real inside view about what's going down. Yeah, thank you. You want to Okay, that's great. Our next issue, who's going to lead this one? Phonics. That's you again, Jules. Go so ahead. So this is really an FYI. I just wanted to thank the school committee for approving um, the purchase of Wilson's. Um, as you probably know, we have rolled, we're rolling out um, training for all of our kindergarten teachers for Wilson's Foundations which is the new phonics program. Uh, we had our first full day of training um, last week at Green, who was hosting both of our trainings, and it was a huge success. We actually had more people show up, 33, and we have a full house for June 7th, which is 30. Um, so we're not just training our regular ed classes, we're also training our ELL and special education K teachers as well, um, so that we can kind of have across the district um, the same formatted training. Um, but just really, that was just really wanted to thank you all for putting that in place. Um, I think it's going to have huge long-term effects on our students. I hope so. Yeah. Uh, my, I got one quick question. That's K to what? We are just doing, this year we're just rolling out in K. But we're going to step it to what, K to three So it's generally, well, foundation, or Wilson's can go all the way up until high school, but we're only looking at K1 and 2 okay. as a rollout, um, and then we're trying to align our pre-K as well okay. um, to the foundation's program. I, I, Tom? So uh, what's a classroom look like? like if they're having fun. They sound out words. They play with that. They play with those sounds. They try to create from those sounds. Is that something, what it might look like? So I don't have a huge background in phonics training. I'm more on the other side or in Gillingham for special education, but their rollout of sounds, letter sounds, um, is a little bit different than what we're currently doing. And yes, it comes with a whole um, system of how we sound out words and how we identify words. Um, and that's what the training is really heavy in, is teaching the teachers in the process of how to roll out the new phonics education. Can I uh, divert for one second? It's in I know that MCAS is, 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 is the MCAS season over? No. Still, it's still in progress, but when it's over, we talked about instilling uh, cursive writing mm -hmm. after, after all of that. Is still, fourth that, and fifth that's still on tap, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, all teachers have um, the packets, the work packets, the curriculum for the cursive writing. That's great, yes. thank you. Kev, you got anything? No. Nope. All set? Okay. I'm glad this is getting going, though. I think this is going to help with our long-term reading stuff. I definitely do. Uh, who's doing the ANET assessment platform? And this is the last time you'll hear from me. <laughs> <laughs> so, again, we spent um, a lot of time researching assessment platforms over the course of the year. Um, I know we've talked about this in past subcommittee meetings. Um, the district as a whole ended up with ANET. Um, as you know, we have five of our schools that have full partnerships with ANET. Um, this year four and next year we will have five that are in the full partnership but district-wide we will utilize the ANET assessment platform. We have a meeting with them on Thursday um, to start the initial district calendaring of our assessments. We have initial proposals for full assessments um, in October and January and March. Um, so we're doing three district-wide benchmark assessments. Um, it also has capabilities, something called My Net for interim assessments. So our department heads have been diving in a little deeper with our teachers in order to decide if they want to have any interim assessments for content areas. But the district as a whole will only be requiring the three benchmark assessments that also comes with a heavy writing piece. Um, we're very excited about it. Um, we also have a full partnership at the district offices for planning and coaching. Um, and as you probably know, the five schools that are going to have the full coaching cycle are five of our six turnaround schools. So very excited about 
that. And again, just wanted to thank you all for approving the purchase of this. I think um, it'll be the first time in a long time that all of our schools will be utilizing the same assessment system and we'll be getting really accurate data back. Kev? Yeah, I do agree. I think it's a great thing to have. I just saw the little graph here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what is that exactly? Is sure. That so that is the last uh, few years of MCAS data. Um, Percentage-wise, I would caution in 2017 and 2018, you'll notice that the two schools besides Durfee, um, they don't have scores. It's because Durfee is just now going to the new MCAS. Um, and then we, so we had kind of a gap year. But really what I wanted to show is that if you really look at the schools, there hasn't been a lot of change in the last five to six years. And so really our work is not as specific. It's more refining that tier one before we get into the interventions. And so really I wanted to focus on this because some of our schools that we saw in the past might have been scoring very high in this new accountability system, they're very close to the lowest 10%. So we really want to make sure that what we're doing, we can really evaluate data effectively across our schools. And it's very difficult when multiple schools are using different assessment systems. Um, so as part of our assessment, we have um, a rollout of the assessed standards, and that's part of our curriculum maps. So we'll be able to really dive in to see which schools are having difficulties on which standards based on the outcome of our benchmark assessments because everybody in the district should be teaching the assessed standards within a certain sequence. And so then they take an, a benchmark. So we'll be able to get quicker data to make faster changes to what we need to do on the ground, as opposed to waiting each year to after the summer to get MCAS right. results. So it's just more <laughs> MCAS rather than ANET. Yes, so that's the top. So one or two schools? I'm sorry? How many schools have already used ANET for a multiple So we years? have three, and then we brought Watson on in February. So I'm sure you've looked at the data, but that's what I was thinking this was related to. In essence, those schools with ANET, are they improving as well? We are we are starting to see improvement, but this is only our second year for three of the schools to have ANET, um, and then we've had a lot of transition in those schools. Um, so I think that this year, and Brian can probably speak to this, um, Derpy's coming on next year. Um, we've had a lot more consistency with coaching, with um, our district leads, with implementation, with training, and I really have to. No, I think it's just time. It's fine. It's not time. I was just didn't know if we had similar because it was in here under the assessment. That's all I was looking for. Oh, okay. In the future, I think we'll get more mm -hmm. of that stuff. I yield. Tommy, <coughs> anything? No. I I <laughs> I got to piggyback on what Kevin said. What does the nine represent? Right now, in 2018, um, Durfee, their um, proficiency was 9%. Okay. And if you look at the costs... They were at 14%. But the year they skipped, but they were at 46 and 16? Yeah. This is Last year, costs and Watson were at MCAS 2.0, so it was a different assessment. Okay. Different assessment. And how they accumulate their scores is, is different than in the past so, years. So. And the benchmarks will be every grade? for the kids to take them next no, year? No, it's in grades three through 10. Grades three through mm -hmm. 10. For MCAS. And how long does the test last? Are you talking about ANET or MCAS? I'm talking about ANET. ANET is, we have it grades two through 12, oh. um, and the benchmark lasts anywhere between 60 minutes and 90 minutes, depending on the assessment. The math assessment tends to go a little quicker, but the ANET has a writing portion, and that's really dependent on the child. That's all on the computer? It's all on the computer. And they correct everything? No, the system corrects it. Now the writing portion, um, we are adding on a writing piece through our department heads, um, and that will be corrected, a uh, team corrections. In-house? Yes. That's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And the 90 minute test, from my experience at Durfee, those were very weary. Mm -hmm. I know they were there for MCAS, but I thought they were like a period, very similar to what a regular school they work like. It depends. depends. Um, and I'll be very honest with you, some of the areas that we've seen um, that are really taking us down is our students, um, not their stamina. 
So we really need to create like test environments to get kids used to testing environments, but also the time that they need to dedicate to it. Um, but when we see across a district with scores like ours, and we do not have lengthy assessments, um, we do have some with test whiz, but then again, we had some schools that picked and choose yeah. what portions that they gave to their kids. Um, we have on the table right now, the department heads for ELA don't want to do the writing piece for ANET, mm. um, but I would strongly advise and did so today not to take that piece out. We need kids practicing, especially in an online forum as much as possible. And Frank has really advocated to get technology in each of our schools. Um, that's the Chromebooks. And we really want kids practicing as much as possible because this is, this is not, um, it's not gonna hurt them if they don't do well. Um, we want them practicing so when it really means something that they're ready and prepared. No, that's, that's all valid. It's just, you know, you don't, if you're gonna run a marathon, you don't run 26 miles every week before it, you're gonna be punchy. And that's what I worry about when I see 90 minute tests, because the kids, I mean, I, I appreciate the stamina and, you're, and you are correct, they do need the practice, but sometimes it gets a little weary for the teachers and the kids and then it's uh Which is why we only ask it three times a year. It seems like we're a testing academy sometimes when you look at these things. But let's, let's give it a ride and hope the scores go up. That's all, I, that's all you can say, I mean, mm -hmm. Because if they tank, you know, I hope you know how to cut grass jewels, you'll be all set. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. We'll see how it works out. Brian, can you say what, how long they usually take in, at your school? Yeah, I think it depends on, on the student. Um, I think a couple things is one is building their skills because if they if kids are gap, have huge gaps, the problem the test becomes frustrating, right? right? I will say teachers use pretty good discretion. I'm not like, well, you better, right? So. We present it, we encourage them, we present it again. If a kid doesn't complete it, they don't complete it. You know, we're hoping that as the year goes on, we've built their capacity and they've gotten better at it. The other big thing with the online is um, it exposes kids to the tools. So one big transition, you know, I was re most recently at elementary, the kids have been testing online, but the grade levels that hadn't yet, um, the ANET, a lot of the tools on there are very similar to the tools on the MCAS. So there's you know, maybe a highlighting function, a drag and drop. So sometimes that's time consuming too, because kids just have to get used to doing that where they would just do everything on paper before, so. And you know what I mean by how nervous I am about this, right? I mean, okay, Kev, yeah. Kev's so up there. So the new heads, department heads, which, Sorry? who are you referring to when you say it was on the table, uh, the department heads don't, don't want to have right LA department heads, um, they put a request in that we do not do the writing piece on ANET and do a self-created writing piece. And my only thing is that I caution is that this is our first year we're going district-wide to do piecemeal again. I'm, I'm not very comfortable with that. My whole feeling is, is let's try it fully implemented the first year. Let's look at our data and see where kids are successful. That doesn't mean we're not gonna do our own written pieces. And I'm talking about our big writing pieces. Um, throughout the year, but I really want to fully exhaust the system and the capabilities before we start piecemealing again. No, I would um, agree with that. Just with, when you said department heads, some schools have them, some don't. Do you just... So it's mainly our middle school and our elementary school who have um, not only, but we also meet with coaches and deans. And so they're, they're the group, the decision makers in my book. Um, I try to facilitate to the best of my ability, but they really should be making decisions. But in this particular area, I pushed back quite hard because I, I don't want to start eliminating things before yeah, we no, even I, tried. As we just approved it to get it. That mm -hmm. Let's use it all, be my opinion. So yeah. I yield. Tom? So Dr. Carlson, are these tests timed? They have time limits on these? I mean, it's timed in the sense that um, a class period, but not really. They they can have we yeah. have windows of time that they take it in, and if they need to take two weeks to take it, we'll let them because it's really not we're not yeah. trying to like we're just trying to find out what they know, what they can do, and, and what they know. We, yeah, we usually offer um, so at Talbot periods of sixty, we usually offer a second period for kids who need to finish it. Some kids will finish it the first in the first you know chunk of time. And if kids need more kid. time. We can give them extra time, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just trying to think about combating test anxiety, right. Right. those kind of issues, mm -hmm. you know. Right. 
So thank you very yep. much. Thank and that's, that's something that we also do is we follow the IEPs and for testing environments. So if they have a small group where they need additional time or instructions read, we'll follow the same um, accommodations that are outlined in their IEPs. Thank you. Yeah, set. Okay, thanks, um, Jules. Um, discussion, ninth grade CVTE exploratory, um, Mr. Medeiros. Well, I'll kick it off. Oh, you uh, kick sure. So, um, right now, Desi's in a phase where they're, they're taking feedback and they're considering some, some revisions to vote technical uh, regulations. Um, certainly, exploratory falls under that. Um, currently, we run uh, most of our ninth graders through the exploratory program so they can sample sample the shops and see if that's something that they're going to What's follow. the duration of that exploratory? <laughs> Get to that. That's <laughs> what the, this, is, this whole thing's about time. Okay? So right now, we're at, we're at 90 hours a year. Okay? Yeah. And Desi's, they're, they're okay with that right now. Um, Mr. Medeiros has uh, networked throughout the state with other comprehensives to, to get advice, to see what they're doing differently, to see how maybe they're bumping it up a little more, because bottom line, Desi wants to see, it as a, at, see us at 198 hours. Okay, we're at 90. They want to see us double that and more if we're going to be uh, meeting the regulations and qualify for, for the funding that comes along with the students going through it. So, we're putting this on the table now because Desi's they're going to have some patience with the comprehensives, but not too much, okay, to get to the, the number that they're looking for. We can't do this all in one fell swoop, okay, because what we're talking about is, is a schedule change. What we're talking about are some, some changes in maybe programming within the freshman year. We've been in discussions now. We're not ready to, we haven't thought it through, but sometime very soon over the course of the summer, it has to be, we're gonna come forward with a program um, for your approval that would modify some things that happened in the freshman year and bring us closer to the 198, but still not there yet. We're thinking we can get to 135 next year with freshmen with, with some changes to what we're doing. Um, perhaps we'll be ready sometime in June to articulate that, but with everything that's going on right now and the thought that needs to go into it, um, we're not talking specific yet. Um, Mr. Woodward, you can talk to the, the, the challenges in terms of the scheduling um, that, that we're having, and then you know, Mr. Medeiros on the technical end with boots on the ground with CTE, um, he can share with you some of the some of uh, what he's learned with with uh, the reconnaissance he's done with other programs. Okay, Joe. Sure. Um, <coughs> so the, the freshman year schedule is, is is pretty tight, and that's why yeah. Mr. Ramirez talked about some adjustments potential and what we currently offer or potentially uh, down the road a schedule change uh, uh, in order uh, to meet the requirements as set forth uh, with DESE. Um, all of our uh, freshman students go through, um, they have six classes uh, and they go through uh, English, Math, Science and History that are full year courses. Um, Currently, uh, the majority of them also take a world language in their freshman year, which is another uh, full year of a course, and then they take health and PE. So as currently instituted, uh, why we're at 90 hours now is because that's the program that the majority of our freshmen uh, go through. Um, so um, in order to bump up the hours, uh, we're looking at different ways to shift some things uh, in order, order to hit those hours. Make any questions on that part of it? Maybe go to the whole. Go to go to great first. Okay, yeah, go ahead. All right. So, in looking at it, you know, statewide and with the whole thing, so it's all based on a Mass General Law, which says something vague like a minimum of one half the year exploratory program if you have five or more programs in your school. So we're living under that right now, and at one point there was a Q and A. If you still look in the manual, that says. Um, one half of that total time would be between 198 and 247 hours. But we're still living in this world where they write the regulations for the regional vote schools, which the way they do it is week on, week off. And so does the um, exploratory. So they have that block of time and it's easy for them to find this amount of time. Um, from what I understand is over the years, comprehensive schools, Taunton, Quincy, others that I've bumped into, they get, um, somewhat of a waiver from that 198 you know somewhere down to like we were talking here um 
140, 180. Um, I think where Oz has slid a little bit is because we've changed our schedule from seven period, five period, six period, and then over the years, things just haven't fit into place. So that's why right now we stand at 90, um, which probably isn't gonna sit well, even without the changes the state's making when they come down and do their program reviews that they do every five years or so. So that's why we're trying to get closer to that 180, which 133 terms seems to be the, the spot that we could live in right now. Going forward from there though, they've, they had a committee a couple of years ago, well, it kind of fell into this past fall where um, unfortunately it was again, folk tech schools dominated the whole conversation and they're trying to get to a point where there's an actual framework for exploratory. Um, and the framework for exploratory, where that makes it different is where they used to have all this leeway before and there was only one paragraph of the Mass General Law. They want to put this framework in place. And the two things that kind of make it very difficult for comprehensive schools, and we kind of got together um, last week at Newton, was that the 198 just seems arbitrary for their, their whole goal for the initiative is to offer quality programs, but 198 just came out of legend from 20 years ago and it keeps getting carried down that 198 is a magic number. And I think maybe at some point we need to try to convince them within this period, they have this um, time right now where they're looking for feedback from, from schools about this new framework that they wanna actually put in place officially. I think it's gonna be a pilot, not next year, the year after, and then mandated the year after that. So, and as I've tried to explain to some of them that in a, in a Vogue Tech School, you can say 249, 198, they get the block of time, it works for them. For a comprehensive school, you gotta tweak the schedule, figure out how you're gonna do it, maybe a year or two years in advance, so all the pieces can fit into place. And as Drew will tell you, sometimes some of these things, the hourly requirements are just the staff that we have on hand that's available to teach all at the same time to teach freshmen. So that's sometimes the, the challenge that we have, the biggest challenge. Yeah. Questions, guys? Tom? Uh, so, Ms. Medeiros, um, is there any advanced curriculum ideas for CVT moving, like, so you got an exploratory going on, and you guys might be willing to uh, afford 135 hours on the year, you know, so that's showing growth from where we're at right now. My experience with the CVTE programming at Durfee has been largely very positive this year. I'm going to many of the luncheons uh, and the trade wins that the kids work their hearts out on, and um, there's some uh, the stuff going on in uh, cosmetology is is nothing short of really great. And I know that we're looking at those as, you know, springboards to create even more coursework in hands-on, overall hands-on learning. We don't talk about the uh, carpentry programming going on too much, but I've seen some really good stuff going on with that as well. So I wanted to know if there's going to be any advanced curriculum ideas in CVTE moving forward. Is anybody, can anybody even think about an answer for that? Um, so, this coming year will be the f where that wave of doubling the programs to have more spots for students will finally hit the senior year. So, we're even, you're talking about culinary, we were just talking about it today, the, the things that we'll be able to do next year would double the amount of students in that senior year and then the same amount in the junior year. Um, so, the advancement becomes you have more numbers you can do more things and so for instance a, a big thing on kind of the agenda I guess is a co-op program because when you talk right the quality points that you get from the state and that type of thing Vogue Tech Schools pick up a lot of those quality points that build into their you know their standing because they have 200 people 250 people go on co-op in a comprehensive school we have to be creative to figure out how to do that of course. So, I mean, in just in talking, right now we have a, you're talking advanced things. We have um, Mass DOT is in the building right now working with some of the construction kids for the whole week. That's kind of almost like their co-op 
but it took a lot to figure out how we were going to get the people in place and then get them to make up the work they're missing and that type of thing. Um, when we put in the application for the Chapter 74 program for the construction program, they asked, are you going to have co-op? Are you going to have internships? Are you going to be working on public grounds? Which would mean our construction program could use materials from buildings and grounds and put sidewalks at Tansy. Spencer Borden or any place where you get transferred. The kids would assist those crews? And well the, the kids would be the crews yeah. run by the instructors. Yeah. And that's something that they're doing in the lab right now. So we could the first transition would be to go to our own public places, our own schools where we're covered by liability and insurance and work on some of those those projects. The next step being, hey, we can get them out for three periods a day. Maybe there'll be some laborers or there'll be some contractors like that are working on the school okay, right so now. So the model is growing. Yeah. The model yeah. is growing and everybody's focused on the growth of that model. I, I, maybe either you or, or Mr. Damaris um, can answer. Kids that are involved in these programmings, uh, whether they be in culinary or carpentry or construction or uh, cosmetology, um, what are the uh, behavioral numbers there? What, what are the disciplinary issues involving these kids? Are they about the same as the other demographics in the school or are they somewhat less because there's so much hands-on, you know, activity going on? So we can say with certainty that they have a lower conduct incident rate, they have a higher attendance rate, and they have a higher graduation rate. That's exactly what I'm thinking about. And that's why I ask these questions, because I'm, I'm, we live in Fall River, and in Fall River there's a strong blue-collar ethic in this community, and for this type of programming to be enhanced at the high school represents clear advancement on behalf of the Fall River Public Schools. And I, I just think it creates a better whole child when more and more kids can take part in these programs. So I'm going to urge you. Uh, I'm going to urge all of you to see what you can do in freshman exploratory and to grab every waking minute you can to get as many kids into expanded exploratory because I really think it's a great way to look at the future. With that, I yield. I, don't, I think you're on the right track. Everybody wants to do the same thing. But you're going to have to do, do your schedule. Like, hey, there's bigger things that you need to do. I keep just listening. It's like you're doing a square peg in a round hole. Can't do it. And, and you can't do everything you want to do, everything the state's requiring you to do, everything the school committee, you know. So, good luck. With <laughs> that's, that's, that's I do think it's valuable, but it might mean that we have to make some other decisions, you know, to give some, give somewhere to balance it out. Um, the thing with, with the vocational, the true vocational schools, is there a lobbying group on, in both sides? No. Because... No, so, so MAVA is dominated by Voc Tech schools because that's their primary business. Um, I think with the new person that's taken over in Newton, she's a curriculum person who was working in a Voc Tech school and she is able to rally some of these groups together to get MAVA to recognize women. We're in that same realm that you're in. And, and actually the meeting that we had in Newton, there was a person from MAVA there, which didn't make a lot of us comfortable talking about issues that fly in the face of folk tech schools, but we still got some things accomplished. I mean, I think that needs to happen on our end, and even with the legislature, because they pass laws that they have no idea what's passing. You know, one stronger lobbying group is saying this, if you don't have the opposite side being presented, you get whatever they give you. So I do think we gotta step it up, you know, to balance it out the best we can. Yeah, and I, I think this will be kind of the initiative that will push that because the comprehensive CT directors have to realize, along with the superintendents, that this is a real big change and this is kind of the state kind of tightening down what it means to be a comprehensive school. So. We're joined by the superintendent. Go uh, offer his uh, insight. Here's the real problem. The real problem is the, the so we received roughly probably a million dollars in uh, Chapter 74 funding for the district's budget because of the way exploratories run. If the state more than doubles the amount of time that our students have to be in exploratory, we will cease to, to uh, realize those funds. That'd be a real burden for the uh, Fall River Public Schools. So 
we have a, a window. We don't have to do it all at once, but there's probably going to be about a three-year window. The regs will come out this fall for comment. They'll be voted on after that. So there's going to be a lot of time for dialogue, hopefully from school committee members and others, about looking at the hours. And then perhaps the department, uh, based on the feedback they get on the regs, will make a decision. Is it 198 hours or is it something less? And if it's something less, does everyone get a piece of money in Chapter 74 programming uh, based on how many hours that they offer? And it really does, and you know, I love the six period day, but it is a burden uh, in our ability to, to provide uh, uh, for uh, uh, increased time in this type of programming. Because you've got the English, Math, Science, Social Studies, and you got to have PE, you got to have wellness, and we got to have world language as well. So, I mean, you think about all those things we try to jam mm -hmm. in, it's, it's a lot of work. The real problem here is that there's a, uh, on this, this item that you raised with the, not only the hours, but also what defines CVTE programming. And then, for example, a career counselor providing career services counts towards career counseling, correct? But if that person is not CVTE licensed, the state's saying, well, that shouldn't count then. So we're pushing back uh, against the state uh, as they're thinking through these regs to be able to have the comprehensive schools be much more flexible. For, we're not regional vocational schools. Our graduation standards are different. We have different things that we have to accomplish in, in the six and a half hours that we have kids. So we're asking for freedom, uh, freedom and flexibility. Your point about who's lobbying is, is spot on because there isn't a lobby on the comprehensive side uh, uh, about uh, uh, regional vocational program. I'll give you another example. For example, in 2013, there was discourse about why don't we make this a, a charter lottery system to get into the vocationals. Guys like Mr. Martin's heads explode when they hear those kinds of things because it's a merit-based system. That's how kids get into the you know grades and behavior and those things. If it was like a charter system, it would just be who shows up, they draw a lottery and kids get in. Those are examples of what the regs, uh, the debates going on the regs since 2013. How many hours, what's the system for kids to get in, what are we requiring for certifications? It's very confusing. We brought this here for you tonight just so we can get ahead of it and be able to say to you, we're going to have to make some changes and if we don't, we risk uh, losing money. But not only that, we built, what do we got, eight programs now? Nine. 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 Where's my state, Mr. Martin? When I got here, there was five. I have nine now. Uh, yeah. that, that is a huge, <laughs> huge increase. In, in order to sustain that, we got to get these kids experiencing in ninth grade all that we have to offer. So expanding the uh, exploratory is something that I'm, I'm happy to hear that uh, you guys support. Uh, but most importantly, that the high school knows and understands and can s spend some time looking at it. It's going to require some work with our unions uh, and others because we've got to look at the schedule, not next year, but down the road over the next couple of years. Did I just hear you say uh, that the state gives less money? The state gives less money for less hours? No, they'll get to a place. Right now, we're all we're getting the same amount of money as other schools that are offering 190 hours. Right. And the argument is, well, that's not fair. So we would get less or none unless we get to an equitable position in terms of what they require as a floor. So at 135, we're going to get less than other schools. We don't know that yet, but what we'll show is a, a gesture of goodwill and faith that we're moving. And we want to, you know, quality programming is real. So we want quality programming. So we want to increase the time that the students have. We just don't know if it's going to be anything less than this, get zero, or if you get 135, you get half of what you used to get. You understand? But, you know, we talked for years uh, about, you know, it's about $4,000, am I right about that, Mr. Martin? About $4,000 per kid additional in Chapter 74 uh, uh, for the kids that are in exploratory in the majors. $1.6 million right now. Right. So it's <coughs> $1.6 million additional, and that money goes back in the program. So that's why we've been able to grow more program, and we're hiring a, um, if the budget passes, we have a, a a guy, a CBTE specific career guidance person, and we got some other positions that are really going to be helpful to the rolling out the program. And as we think, 
you know, I'm challenging these guys. How do we build that now into seventh and eighth grade? So then we got kids that understand there's Diamond, there's Bristol, but Durfee also has a ton of great programs. Go ahead, Tom. Yeah, you just stole uh, my thought. I was just going to say the middle schools. You said we want to try to bring it down, down to that level too. Keep it growing. No, I'm, I'm very pleased with the overall growth as it, as it looks now. I want to keep that sustained effort so that we continue to compound that growth yeah. moving into the future. Thank you. I yield. Anything further? Good luck, guys. Entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Agam? Yes. Mr. Coogan? Yes. Mr. Corey? Yes. Can I be a voice?